every once in a while I pick up a book just laying on one of my shelves because I know that it's really important and I read it not so much out of uh, that I'm fascinated to read it but just because I know that I should and I should that I should know more about the subject and this was one of those it was kind of a mixed experience so I'll tell you a little bit about it it's called uh, the gift this is a, a recent reissuing of it uh, the gift the form and reason for exchange in archaic societies uh, ignore that sort of clumsy subtitle but it's by Marcel Mauss um, the gift is probably um, you, you may recognize Mauss's name he was a uh, pretty well-known French anthropologist during the early part of the 20th century and the gift is probably one of the only things that people still read by him. It's very short. Um, in fact, about half of this book is notes and commentary, and it's still a pretty thin book. So um, the book itself is um, about 80 or 85 pages long. In fact, it's called, um, in, in French, Moss called it an essay, and that actually might be more appropriate. Uh, this was originally published in 1925, and it's one of the most influential pieces of anthropology written in the whole 20th century. Uh, it explores the economies of pre-capitalist cultures and peoples from several different parts of the world, including Melanesia, Polynesia, and the Pacific Northwest. This specific edition has an introduction by Mary Douglas, who is herself a uh, wonderful social and cultural anthropologist in her own right. Um, and I espe especially recommend this because it's a brilliantly done, wonderful, concise introduction. And it also sheds a lot of light on what Moss talks about and sometimes leaves unclear. In fact, if you can't even read the entire essay slash book that Moss wrote, read the introduction because it it pretty much sums up everything that you'll encounter later in the book. Uh, for those interested in the history of anthropology and its development over time, uh, like I am, uh, Moss was one of Emil Durkheim's greatest students. In fact, Durkheim was also Moss's uncle, and his influence can be seen quite a bit throughout the work. Uh, while Durkheim believed in the individual um, as in the physical individual and the potential for individual action, he was also a vocal critic of individualism per se, as we would understand it. Uh, for example, he recognized that individualism couldn't explain uh, certain phenomena that we see in cultures like ruled governed action, um, which is of course rife in both our society and, and most others that you'd encounter. Durkheim's positivism is also on full display, and Mauss never feels his point is made unless he's shown it several times with several different tribes or people all over uh, different parts of the world. The main idea here is the centrality of what Mauss calls the gift. Now, what does that mean? Is it, is it you know, very different from the way we use the word gift? Uh, when, he, when he uses the word, it's an item given within a complex set of social relations and institutions which at the same time comprises those relations and institutions. Now that sounds clumsy, uh, probably because I wrote it. Um, that's not Mary Douglas's or, or Mouse's description at all. But he, what he's talking about is giving things and receiving them back and this notion of sort of sharing things and, and the idea of reciprocity, both of which I'll talk about in a minute. Moss also, um, like I said, he emphasizes that mutuality and the, the obligatory nature and the reciprocity of gift giving. Uh, he says, even the idea of a pure gift is contradictory. By ignoring the universal custom of compulsory gifts, we make our own record incomprehensible to ourselves. 
right across the globe and as far back as we can go in history of human civilization, the major transfer of goods has been by cycles of obligatory returns of gifts. I, I think I just said he said. That's actually from Mary Douglas's introduction. Uh, just as important is the way in which gifts function within an economic system. And of course we do have to think about this as an economic system because this is way before the rise of anything that we would recognize as uh, modern or even pre-modern capitalism. He even hints at how these gift economies, which he calls them, softly echo the dynamics of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Uh, Mary Douglas says, gift complements market insofar as it operates where the latter is absent. The following quote, uh, again taken from Douglas's introduction, is very central and important, so I'll read it in full. Quote, like the market, it, the gift, supplies each individual with personal incentives for collaborating in, in the matter of exchanges. I made a typo there, excuse me. Uh, gifts are given in the context of public drama with nothing secret about them. In being more directly cued to public esteem, the distribution of honor, and the sanctions of religion, the gift economy is more visible than the market. Just by being visible, the resultant distribution of goods and services is more readily subject to public scrutiny and judgments of fairness than are the results of market exchange. In operating a gift system, a people are more aware of what they're doing, as shown by the sacralization for their institutions of giving. As mentioned above, Moss's work is exhaustively ethnographic insofar as he visits different people and visits different tribes. I mentioned Melanesia, Polynesia, the Pacific Northwest, etc. He also talks about Roman law, uh, ancient Hindu law, um, Vedic law, etc. Uh, he talks about also the Maoris, uh, or the Maori, uh, native to, uh, of course, New Zealand, and their concept of something they call the, the hao. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's uh, spelled H-A-U. And the hao is the spirit in something that inheres in things as they're passed on from person to person and from generation to generation. Uh, Maus says that what imposes obligation in the present received in exchange is the fact that the thing received is not inactive. Uh, even when it has been abandoned by the giver, it still possesses something of him. And through it, the giver has a hold over the beneficiary, just as being its owner, through it he has a hold over the thief. And that thing that inheres in the object, and apparently... Um, accretes around it is the how that that thing that that is passed on with the gift that's also um, in addition to it Moss again emphasizes the the importance of reciprocity as he does with every uh, tribe or people that he discusses um, quote in this system of ideas one clearly and logically realize that one must give back to another person what is really part and parcel of his nature and substance because to accept something from somebody is to accept, accept some part of his spiritual essence of his soul to, ref to retain that thing would be dangerous and mortal not only because it would be against law and morality but also because that thing coming from the person not only morally but physically and spiritually that essence, that food, those goods whether movable or immovable, those women or those descendants, those rituals or those acts of communion, all exert a magical or religious hold over you. In the second chapter, Moss discusses the Trobriand people, who are perhaps best known for um, or from uh, Branislaw Malinowski's ethnographic work, uh, Argonauts of the Western Pacific. Uh, Malinowski, um, if you're not familiar, is uh, another anthropologist who, who worked very extensively with the Trobriand people. Uh, things look remarkably the same here, too. 
Um, at the bottom of this system, he says, of internal kula, and kula uh, is the word, the trobriand word for a gift economy, or what Moss is calling a gift economy. Uh, the system of gift through exchange permeates all the economic, tribal, and moral life of the trobriand people. It is impregnated with it, as Malinowski very neatly expressed it. It is a constant give and take. The process is marked by a continuous flow in all directions of presents given, accepted, and reciprocated, obligatorily and out of self-interest, by reason of greatness and for services rendered through challenges and pledges. Uh, many Western civilizations seem to have economies in which item exchange, um, some items are exchanged obligatorily and others where it isn't and these are sort of mixed within a given culture. Moss recognizes that and sees this perhaps as a problem and uh, attempts to address it. He asks uh, rhetorically, quote, yet are not such distinctions fairly recent in the legal systems of our great civilizations? Have these not gone through a previous phase in which they did not display such a cold calculating mentality? Have they not in fact practiced these customs of the gift that is exchanged in which persons and things merge? He claims that a more detailed analysis of Indo-European legal theory will indeed show that this transition can be located historically. Whether Maus ever finds this transition point, at least in this essay, is questionable though. In the last chapter, uh, Moss attempts to tie the concept of gift economy to trends in modern-day social democracy. I remember he's writing in 1925. And here he pretty much completely fails, as Douglas points out in the uh, introductory essay. He says that the concept of a safe social safety net provided by the mutual sharing of tax dollars is analogous to the gift economies that he's been talking about. However, he completely ignores the coercive power of the modern state in making this comparison. Part of the reason why potlatch uh, confers such honor with many of the people discussed is because the person or family of their own accord decide how much to sacrifice in the act of gift giving. The state, on the other hand, makes laws which makes this giving non-obligatory. In all the other circumstances we've been talking about giving how much you want, when you want. Uh, if you don't give, you know, in the modern state, the state uses its coercive power to come in, arrest you, fine you, perhaps put you in prison. Um, you pay the punishment, right? Uh, Moss's politics sort of shine through here in his defense of social democracy but unfortunately they have nothing to do with the topic of the book at hand. Moss's style is pretty dry and demonstrative. Uh, much of the book is taken up with etymologies of Indo-European words, sometimes in a sort of convoluted attempt to support his ideas. Uh, even when the ideas are clearly presented, the translator, who is um, W.D. Halls, should have mentioned that earlier, uh, the translator sometimes leaves a lot of the words untranslated, so you get these Maori words or these uh, Sanskrit words, which you know, almost no one is going to be able to recognize. And he'll just mention maybe a translation of them once, and then every time after that use the original word. So you have to sort of flip back and forth, um, because it's, it's tough to, to remember all of those new words for 20 or 30 or 40 pages at a time. Um, there is one really interesting thing though. This book was a huge influence on, like I said, a lot of people earlier, including a writer by the name of Lewis Hyde, who's, uh, one of whose books was assigned for a college class that I took once. Um, the book is called The Gift, Imagination, and the Erotic Life of property. And we were only assigned small parts of that book, but now that I've read this, I really want to go back and read that because it seemed really, really fascinating at the time, and I should have read it all when I was assigned it.
but um, the gift, um, Lewis Hyde's The Gift, turns 30 this year. So do Lewis Hyde a favor and go read his book, because it's really fascinating too. Anyway, if you're interested in the history of anthropology, um, there's certainly more you know, page-turning books out there, but um, this is certainly influential. It makes up for it in that respect. The Gift, The Form and Reason for Exchange in Archaic Societies by Marcel Mauss.